The most comprehensive look at the world of business, finance and economics. Tonight we want to talk about the matters regarding sustainable finance. Sustainability is the new name of the game. Everywhere you talk about it, certainly it's ringing bells, discussing whether it's finance, whether it's planning, whether it's the national policy, whether it's fiscal or macro level, we are talking about sustainability. And tonight I am joined by an eminent panel to talk about sustainable finance and how we can get a strong pipeline of bankable projects to enable us to deploy the capital that is available for this. And we are are joined on set by James Zagin, Managing Principal, Corporate and Investment Banking from Absa Bank Kenya. James Karibusana. Thank you very much. Cecilia Murai, to my left, Senior Specialist, Green Finance at FSD Africa. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And Krishna Swarup, Chief Finance Officer from Sun King, dealing a lot with solar energy. Karibusana. Thank you. Lady and gentlemen, thank you so much for creating time to be with us on this conversation. When we put our poster out, let me start with you, James. A lot of Kenyans came back at me asking, what exactly are you talking about when you speak to the issue of sustainable finance? Very briefly, James, what is sustainable finance? No, thank you very much, Julian. And um, again, it's a pleasure to be here with you this, this evening. So sustainable finance, uh, especially from a banking perspective, uh, relates to the activities of the bank, which are done in a manner which en empowers and ensures that every cent of money we give out is, is given towards achieving promotion of environment sustainability, social sustainability, and governance sustainability. Uh, so in, in line with our, um, you know, our, our purpose statement, which is empowering Africa's tomorrow together, one story at a time, the, the tomorrow component becomes very, very critical in that in everything we, we do, we have to make sure that we live tomorrow better than we found it to, uh, in, uh, in the state that we found uh, today at. So for us, that's a very critical component of our uh, sustainable finance proposition in that it has to be empowering and it has to be fostering and pushing forward the agenda of, of the three key uh, components that I mentioned. And APS is one of the entities who are listed whom we have seen issuing sustainability reports in the recent past. And not, not too far back, actually, you released your latest. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, yeah, so our, our sustainability report is where we come out to actually showcase to our stakeholders the activities which we're doing to actually live what we are actually saying that we do. So there are very, very critical pillars that we look out for when we, talk, when we, we, we publish in our sustainability report. We, we demonstrate what we're doing from the environment perspective, uh, which is again, as I mentioned, critical in what we do as a bank, that when everything we do has to be driven towards ensuring that the environment is well taken care of and ensure that there's growth in the environment. On the social aspect, uh, I think it's extremely critical that we engage in activities that bring up social well-being. Yeah. And this can be in many instances. It could be around youth. It could be a, 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 around, you know, um, uh, uh, women. It could be around, you know, the disadvantage in, in society and, and, and the population at large that the financial well-being and financial inclusion of society at large has to be demonstrated by the activities that we actually do. Governance, again, becomes a critical component. Yeah. Uh, as we know that empowering and enforcing governance, we, as a bank, we are in a privileged position where we can actually encourage and enforce that in our customers that in to partner we all have to demonstrate solid governance practices in all that we do so that becomes re very very critical and then we also look at influencing policy to ensure that we play a leading role in influencing policy on matters that then drive the sustainability agenda around esg which again is a critical pillar of the business that we do and we'll be touching a lot more on influencing policy further down the road but let me come to krishna so he sits on the lending side. You are, if I could say, on the implementing side. Tell us about Sun King and how you are playing with this sustainability space. Thank you, Jilmo. Uh, Sun King is the world's largest off-grid solar pay-as-you-go company. So what we do is that we design, manufacture, distribute, service, and finance solar products for off-grid customers. Um, so off-grid customers are typically low-income groups, low to middle-income groups in most of the economies we work with. And uh, we have been doing this since 2008, uh, in Kenya since 2016. Uh, we have sold more than 23 million products so far, uh, about 15, 17 million of them in Kenya alone. And we have uh, around 4 million active customers. And uh, we sell products ranging from a small lantern all the way to a solar inverter. Right? So by definition, the products we sell are environmentally friendly, they are green because they are all solar energy based. Now where uh, 
your question about sustainable finance, I would take the liberty to answer that as well, is yeah. comes into picture in our scenario is uh, how do we weave sustainability requirements into financing decisions, right? So that right starts right from the place what we sell, how do we manufacture, how do we sell and how do we dispose. So entire value chain right from production to the end stage disposal. End to end. End to end. Correct. You have to make it sustainable. And yeah. when you say sustainable, what does it mean? Environmentally friendly, socially conscious or socially impactful and then governance. Why, is, why are they important? Environment because it's survivability is at stake. Yeah. Right. Social because that's how you achieve uh, equity and justice for everything that you do and governance is the steering part of it. How do you ensure that you're on the right track? So when you involve these three components, E, S and G, environment, social and governance into your financing framework, that becomes sustainable financing. I see. Fantastic. Cecilia, tell us about FSD Africa and specifically what you're doing in sustainable finance. Thank you so much. So FSD Africa stands for Financial Sector Deepening Africa. Uh, we are a specialized development agency focusing on financial and capital market development across Africa, uh, making financing work for Africa's sustainable future. Um, we've been in existence for 10 years uh, with funding from the UK government, but now also more funding partners are coming on board. Um, we are active in projects in 33 countries across the continent, uh, but we are headquartered here in Kenya, yeah, okay. incorporated here in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, and we provide uh, support uh, through grants, technical assistance, and we also have an investment arm that can provide catalytic early stage yeah. finance. And so what I would say in terms of what, how our work links to sustainable finance, we work across the entire finance value chain because all these pieces need to fit together so that we can move large pools of capital to where they are needed um, across the economy. Um, and this includes, we're working on the enabling regulatory environment, um, supporting the institutions that are needed. So for example, we've recently um, supported the establishment of the Ethiopian Stock Exchange. Um, it also includes supporting uh, project preparation and transactions and developing investable instruments uh, with blended capital. Yeah. And that can also enable domestic institutional investors and other investors to take part in the sustainability sort of wealth creating opportunity. And a lot of our instruments are also focused on the SME segments. So all in all, this is already sustainable finance on its own. But in addition, we are also very intentional about making sure that in the projects and instruments uh, we support, there is an intent to make sure uh, things, uh, long-term risks and opportunities like climate resilience, yep. social inclusion are incorporated. And this can be under bo uh, instruments like green bonds, social bonds, gender bonds, sustainability bonds, and equity. There are many different instruments that can be used. Yeah. Um, and just to bring it further to you know, uh, practical examples, we had the privilege of working with Acorn Student Housing on their affordable uh, student housing uh, developments, which were also resource efficient and yes. green. Um, we've worked with Burn Manufacturing, which is a manufacturing plant here in Kenya, creating jobs uh, with uh, cook stoves that are 70% more efficient yeah. than conventional cook stoves. The list goes on and on. We have supported <laughs> some 20 uh, issuances in the sustainable bond space over the past uh, uh, few years, amounting to 1.2 uh, billion US dollars equivalent, most of it in local currency. Wonderful. I'll be coming back on the <laughs> issue of uh, climate resilience and uh, the risk on that side. But let me come to James before we take a break. Uh, very quickly, James, many of those who play in the sustainability finance space will indicate that whereas we have liquidity on our side, the question of bankability or investable projects is still quite a headache. We don't have an investment opportunity which we think we can deploy this capital. Is this something you experience and how you're addressing it? Yes, um, in, indeed you're, you're right that um, initially and as the stakeholders at large were still grappling with how to define sustainability, uh, that, was, uh, that was quite a challenge as it were. But, but we in APSA and especially from our ambition to impact and influence, we made a very, very intentional decision that from an advisory perspective, we needed to start working with our clients on the journey on curating sustainability in the way they do their, their, their business. And just based on the ESG framework, we started seeing 
a big adoption by clients to actually make their businesses sustainable. And what I like about this is that we moved from a stage of avoiding businesses that were deemed to be not sustainable, you know, some extractive, sector, extractive sectors, etc., to a stage where it's nearly becoming a, a license to do business. Your sustainability practices, whether it's in buildings, uh, tenants are now asking, you know, can you demonstrate that this building is green? Yep. Uh, we as APSA, our own supplier base, go through an ESG assessment to ensure that their practices are sustainable. And we are seeing globally it's becoming the norm. If you talk to our, our clients in the horticultural sector, in the flower sector, their social practices within the farms are being tested on the environment side of it, on the social impact, especially given they are large employers, etc. So you're finding that in the nature of the business we are seeing now, everybody is trying to get energy efficient. That normally comes with very, very clear sustainable practices. And we are seeing that now curating out in a manner that actually sustainable bankable uh, propositions are now becoming a lot more present. But we are very, very clear that we look for partners, the likes of the IFCs of the world, FSDs of the world, to ensure that that advisory part in terms of showing, showcasing how to make businesses sustainable so that they can be bankable from a sustainable perspective uh, is a reality. And I must admit, in the recent past, we've seen a foray of a lot of projects coming through in different sectors, whether it's in the power sector, where we have a lot of expertise in power utility and infrastructure, whether it's in the agri sector, whether it's in the real estate sector, whether it's even in affordable housing, all those components that actually fit into, um, into sustainable financing uh, 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 um, uh, business criteria are actually now becoming more and more, uh, more and more present. We are also seeing a lot of companies that are looking to uh, social impact, uh, financial deepening and financial access to uh, parts of the economy that previously did not have access to, uh, you know, to affordable financing. And yeah. we also do actively partner with those kind of entities. Many people think they are competitors. We say, no, they are partners <laughs> to allow us to achieve that objective of driving social financing and affordable financing yeah, in, in, in a wider part of, of the economy. So, yes, initially there was a challenge. Okay. Increasingly now, we are seeing that many clients, it's becoming a license to do business and therefore are, are, are very, very willing to take advice on how to make their businesses and their projects sustainable to support uh, sustainable financing. So clearly the tide has shifted. Before we Absolutely. venture into the next part of that question, and I'll be throwing that at uh, Krishna next to me here, let's take a very quick break. We shall be back and uh, explore more on the question of how do we exactly do this at scale? Stay tuned. Is Dove better than ordinary soap? We're going to prove it. Take a barrel of your soap and Dove. Use yours on one side, Dove on the other. The soap part feels rough. The Dove side is softer, smoother, and more radiant. With one quarter moisturizing cream, Dove deeply nourishes for radiant skin all over. Try Dove and feel the difference. Wow. Lakini vile hii ekonomi imetufinya, ilinibidi kubadilisha sabuni ni katumia ingine rahisi. Bala! Ilibidi nioshe kila kitu marambili. Sikuwa na otherwise, ni karudia area. Area, usafibora kwa mwosho mmoja tu. Usiatu nyuma. Join us at the Standard Chartered Nairobi Marathon. Register by visiting www.nairobimarathon.com and help us move Kenya forward. Standard Chartered Nairobi Marathon. Run! Embrace possibility. With Glovo, Unoes order anything you want from your city. Fish choma, burgers, groceries, snacks, drinks. Kitu yote from the pharmacy. Hata uteo. And Glovo brings it to you in minutes. Nike kufikia, you're left with this mmm face. With this Ama this one. Yeah! With Glovo, Uno is a track your order and also contact customer support, which is always available. Download the app, order anything you want, and we'll deliver in minutes.
Welcome back to this conversation on sustainable finance on Business Redefined, your weekly most comprehensive look at the world of business, finance and economics. We are picking up from the first leg of this conversation where James again took us to the break speaking about the question of availability of capital, bankability of projects. And Krishna, who's here with us from Sun King, talking about 23 million products in the market, it looks like you have hit the sweet spot around the scale conversation. How can we do this at scale? Uh, I think there are, there are different stages to hit that scale. Right? It doesn't over happen overnight. You need to get the right product. You need to have the uh, reach the right customer, and you need to create the right value proposition for the customer. You need to uh, sell what the customer needs, and at a price point that he can afford. Yeah. Right. For example, the, the one of the largest products that we sell is solar lanterns, um, and we sell about a hundred thousand of them every month in Kenya, and they cost half the price of a kerosene lantern that a consumer will spend every day. Now, there's a, that's, that's how you have to design your products in the manner that they're useful for the end customer. Yeah. So, uh, scalability will come when the product is useful and affordable. So, that's, that's the first part of it. Then the second part of it is that despite having many businesses have very good products which are required, they often struggle from getting the right financing at the right, kind of, right point of time. And this is where investors like APSA Bank or any other investors, FSD Africa also comes into play at different phases of business. How can they support uh, ESG impactful businesses from getting reaching up to that scale? Yeah. It requires the right kind of financial intervention, right kind of financial support at different stages, perhaps in equity, perhaps in debt, perhaps in a mix of both. The right product, the right value proposition, the right financing, and that's why I want to come to Cecilia here. When you talk about the right financing, some players in the market have told me, look, we don't think we have enough opportunities for what we would call patient capital, especially for the small businesses, to be able to navigate this journey into sustainability. How do you address that? Well, I think the good thing is when you as a business owner or as anyone seeking capital, whether this is private sector, public sector, um, the good thing about focusing on sustainability in your projects and assets is that you can access large pools of capital uh, both internationally and on the African continent that are looking for these opportunities because as we have said they understand that these these investments are better investments than if you wouldn't have taken these ESG risks and opportunities into account. Um, so, for example, um, the investment mandates uh, with a sustainability mandate uh, globally runs into the hundreds of trillions of US dollars. Yeah. On the continent, we have the domestic institutional investor base that amounts to about $2 trillion equivalent. Um, and they can provide, these are, some of these are pension funds uh, with long-term liabilities yeah. and that can match uh, long-term needs in infrastructure and other, um, you know, large-scale developments that are needed to address, um, you know, climate risk uh, and so on. Okay. Um, and what is good is that you can also use blended capital. So um, there's, of course, the traditional, uh, you know, uh, sustainability investors in the development finance world, like FSD Africa, but there's also philanthropy is coming into this, play, uh, this space and can provide con concessional funding, um, maturity extension so that you get that you know yeah. longer uh, Tenor. uh, tenors yeah. uh, and, and overall better um, you know terms so that's where the cap pa patient capital uh, can, come, can in. come in in terms nice. of you know putting these instruments together I to see. make them long term yeah. James I know you don't give concessional financing yeah. but how do you ensure you're giving the right capital <laughs> yes, and, and, and I think just to pick up on uh, Cecilia's point is, and that's where the partnership agenda comes, comes yeah. into play. Because yeah. you'll find that all these different pools of capital have different objectives, as it were. So there are, there are the banks which have a role to play, then there's the patient capital, and what is good about the whole partnership agenda is that you find, from a purpose perspective, everybody wants to make that positive impact from a sustainable finance perspective. Correct. And therefore, on the back of that, from a blended finance perspective, you find that we are able to then bring together different sources of capital to ensure that there's affordability um, in the provision of capital for end users and stakeholders to consume to achieve their sustainable uh, finance goals. So you find that because of that blended component, and we, even as a bank, have made the very intentional decision that for projects that 
meet the definitions on the sustainable finance agenda, we will also step in and lean in and give a concession on our own funding. So when we now blend that with, together with uh, development finance institutions, um, other capital pro uh, providers from the private equity side, where we've seen, as was mentioned, investment criteria which demands that certain components have to go to sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable finance projects, that blended financing then comes at a concessional uh, price that can then appeal to end users who are uh, actually conforming to, to, to uh, sustainable finance. So, that, so we've, we've seen that work extremely well in ensuring that, that from the financing side, uh, we also play our role in ensuring that, can, uh, that it can be achieved. Okay. So Zile, allow me to look more now at a more macro level. And we are all talking about the build-up to um, COP29 in Azerbaijan. And many have asked, with every progressive meeting, are we really pushing the envelope forward as far as sustainability and especially sustainable finance is going? Look at how the, looking as, at how this sensitive, the question of financing, especially for the, the global south, is when it comes to these matters of uh, the global scene. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, I, absolutely we are moving the conversation forward, uh, although maybe not at the speed uh, that, that is needed. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, I mean, yes, as you say, there's a lot at stake at this COP29. Uh, we have um, the new uh, common quantified goals to be determined. So these are the uh, financing commitments by the historical large emitters, what they will put forward uh, to emerging markets for the green transition. Uh, we have a continuation of the global financial architecture reform, which takes place in many other uh, venues as well, but yes. also at COP. Uh, we also have um, the next round of the National uh, Determined Contribution, the NDCs, yes. that need to be established. So indeed, there's a lot at stake at COP, and the window to address these things is ever shortening. But still, we do have the opportunity uh, to make sure we reduce uh, global greenhouse gas emissions and provide the financing that is needed for the green transi transition. So that conversation is crucial. But again, um, in parallel, and in the meantime, as that is happening, we also need to develop our markets at home. Correct. Um, and that's also the narrative that changed significantly. If we look back at the African Climate Summit that was hosted here in Kenya with the AU, and how the green economy is seen as the, the best path uh, for Africa, it just makes, makes economic sense. Um, and that means investing in the riches that the continent has in terms of critical minerals, the uh, renewable energy sources. And if we can uh, couple that with energy sector reform to bring uh, down costs, yeah, and yeah. Uh, then we can attract the global supply chains for processing of agri and the uh, minerals and we can also enable clean transport. And so all of this can happen with a lot of the capital and instruments that are already available. Um, so we don't need to wait uh, necessarily for the outcomes at COP. We can already um, continue the, work, the good work that is already ongoing uh, with the likes of institutions like uh, APSA and in the renewable energy sector. Okay, and Krishna, uh Many times when you have this kind of conversations around sustainable finance, the perception out there is that we are having a top tier discussion which is for large corporates. And many times I'm asked whether there are solutions for small entities who are ready and willing to embed this whole sustainability conversation into their day-to-day -day practice. One, do you consider yourself small, medium sized, or where do you place yourself? And do you think there are solutions for this kind of businesses? Uh, at this stage, Sun King, I think I would consider them a medium-sized company, at least in Kenya. And uh, the answer is yes and no. Are there solutions available for small and medium-sized enterprises if they embark on the sustainability journey? Is funding easily available? The answer is probably no. But is the funding at all available? The answer is probably yes. No. Um, to, to one of your earlier questions where you said, uh, do investors there is pools of capital, but investors complain that there are not enough sustainable projects available. More often than not, what it means is that it's not that sustainable projects are not available. It means that sustainable projects that give the same risk reward ratio as a traditional project are not available. I don't have, yeah. Yeah. So it's so the, for both small and medium sized enterprises, the uh, the course of action is to look at the risk and reward for the project. How do we reduce the risk in the project, 
and how do we give a reward that is comparable maybe i'm not saying it should be top notch or better than a traditional project but at least comparable to certain level that somebody like apsa or any other investor can substantiate the lower cost of funding that they're willing to offer you know if a traditional project is giving you a 10% return perhaps an 8% return for a sustainable project should is acceptable, acceptable. <laughs> but if a traditional project is giving you 10% and a sustainable project is giving you 2% it will never find financing <laughs> yeah so the trick is we don't miss the basics we don't need to miss the basics of risk and reward yeah, end of the yeah. day it's still financing yes so how do we blend the sustainability element and how do we get standardize the risk and reward uh, for sme businesses that remains a trick and there are no easy answers there there are no ready made answers there yeah. uh, at sun king we did a securitization 130 million dollar local currency securitization last year and uh, that involved pooling 2 and 1/2 million customers receivables into a separate vehicle and raising financing for that yeah now that was under sustainable financing framework um, so effectively if each one of each of this 2 and 1/2 million customers went to any traditional lender they wouldn't get financing for a solar uh, product at their home Yeah. but now because they have been aggregated the risk and reward have been managed we were able to do a securitization for 130 million dollars worth in local currency yeah. it was the first of its kind complete local currency securitization in kenya and perhaps in larger sub saharan african context outside of south africa but you see now uh, krishna and now to throw the question now to uh, james here he's talked about aggregation and this might work for the small kind of fragmented businesses yeah. there are players in the energy sector who are large with each every each and every project they undertake having large upfront costs and the question always is how do we de-risk such entities to make them attractive to players like apsa when it comes to sustainable financing yeah and 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 that's where our our project finance capabilities as apsa come actually come into play because as krishna has mentioned um securitization is a very very good tool for de-risking projects yeah. and for diversifying the risk and packaging a project in a manner that you can then all sell it to different investors and different collaborative banks to actually spread uh, to actually spread that risk so f- for us that's always a critical component that we actually play from an advisory perspective that when it comes to those kind of projects where they are interested participants but not at the scale of the project yeah. because the risk from one person is a little bit too large then we have to come into the originate and distribution capabilities that we do from our investment banking perspectives where we can then break up that project into bite sized chunks and sell them down to different levels of investors and you can even strata them to levels of risk that different investors are actually able to take so you find that we bring in partners like development finance institutions who are actually interested in the impact and the positive impact of that project and therefore are able to even risk participate and then we are able to put together a financing proposition and solution that then makes it appealing and able to attract financing from investors who otherwise wouldn't have gone in on the project on its own mm-hmm. so it in, it entails the capabilities in house around the structuring bringing in additional partners bringing in risk participant part partners and even hedging capabilities to manage the hedgeable risks whether it's a currency risk in it you did a local currency one the people who want in foreign currency yes. etc so we have to bring in those capabilities that we have in house to ensure that we can package the transaction in a manner that makes it then appealing to to outside investors to actually come in and play in smaller size chunks yeah. as opposed to a big risk that one person has to carry all right yeah. and cecilia even as you speak about the risk reward ratio and how to de-risk some of these uh, undertakings when you talk about climate risk and often times climate risks are outsized and we are still not yet sure how to figure out how to price in this risk how do we navigate that in that context right yeah that's a very multifaceted question so thank you for for asking <laughs> me that <laughs> um i think um i mean we also have to remember what is the cost of doing nothing uh the cost of inaction increases yeah, day yeah. by day Uh, so what we must do with um the projects that need to be implemented uh, we need to look at fundamental you know project planning and design and incorporate um the mitigating and adapting uh, to climate if we're talking about climate change these factors that will mitigate and adapt to climate change at the early uh, planning stage yes. uh, so to minimize that risk going into the future 
Um, and I think it's great news hearing uh, what uh, what the other yes. panelists are saying because I think that, that it has really been a change in that financiers are interested to dig into this slightly more challenging uh, pipeline of the sustainability um, projects and looking at how partnerships with uh, you know different risk um, you know how we can mitigate risk and and really de-risk these instruments where whereas perhaps some years ago you know it would be easier to just do some other deal but now <laughs> we are in you know it, we we uh, this is the way the world is going and um yeah uh so i think uh, the cost of inaction and the business case for some of these things like adaptation you know urban resilient yeah, uh, yeah. investment the business case is there and we just need to dig in and use the tools and the instruments that we have um, to sort of build it into project design at the early stages. Okay. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the standardization and reporting because that has been uh, what many have called the elephant in the room for a very long time. We are in a space where for a long time there haven't been clear reporting guidelines. Uh, in Kenya, we have seen uh, IFRS S1 and S2 launched in September last year. Maybe let me start with Krishna. In your business, how are you integrating this reporting into your, now what we call the integrated framework of reporting, from away from the yes. double bottom line to the triple? Yes, so uh, you're right, standardizing reporting framework for sustainability initiatives and their impact is really, really important, right? Unless we know that everyone is talking the same language, you would never know what, yeah. what it actually means. So standardization is a tool for ensuring that people, when, when say, James wants to invest and say, I need, I need this impact, and I'm, I'm reporting on X amount of impact, the, the, the impact that he means and I did are the same, right? Now, uh, that standardization is only possible when, uh, so IFRS S1 and S2 is a good step forward in that. Uh, it tries to define a framework on how do you identify your major risks that will have a financial impact on your business, mm. right? Then it, it defines a mechanism to identify what kind of risks, what is the financial impact, what do you disclose, and how much do you disclose, and what do you need not disclose. Okay. And once you do that, then there's an industry where that's, that's typically about S1, then S2 talks about industry level guidance, how do you measure impact metrics, and what are the safeguards. Now, this is uh, an outcome of a long series of uh, sustainability guidelines that are being issued by various regulators. You have SFDR in EU, you have SEC related guidelines for sustainability reporting in US. So, all of these are good step forward. I'm, I'm, uh, and I understand Kenya is also developing its own uh, local standards for sustainability reporting. So all of that is important to provide a standardized guidance on how do we, how do we have to do it. Yeah. Now talking about something, how do we do it? As a uh, industry association, we have a body called Gogla, and Gogla has a standard impact reporting metrics framework, which has been developed a few years ago. So whatever impact we report follows the standardized template that the industry body had already. Uh, uh, already created a few years ago. Now, even that framework, that methodology keeps on changing uh, because as the new technology comes in, as new realizations come in, you need to upgrade. You need to, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, create more relevant guidelines for it. So, um, we are making good progress on that front, on standardizing the reporting framework and what to report, how to report. Uh, there's good progress there, but yes, there is still a little distance to travel. I see. James, yeah. you sitting now on piles of cash on your side, when you're on the origination phase, are you now making it mandatory that if you're coming to us, we want to see you reporting alongside this kind of standards? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it is inculcated in our standards now, in our enterprise risk management framework. The whole sustainability agenda is actually part and parcel of even our own credit assessment. In fact, we've got part of our assessment to our ESG officers actually do assessments and the clients do report, especially on amounts over $5 million and above, that is a standard requirement that it has to conform to sustainability practices for us to even progress we, 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 you know, with, the, with the transaction as it were. So we've actually put it, made it part and parcel of our DNA of how we do business to ensure that both we and our clients actually subscribe to sustainability practices in the projects that, uh, that we undertake. I see. Cecilia, for the small businesses who are always asking me that, uh, look, we don't have the money for the big fours to come and help us integrate these kind of things. What sort of hand-holding can be done to ensure that then they are also 
taking and charting this path of uh, this sort of standardization in their reporting? Um, so both on the reporting and on issuing instruments, yes, we can provide uh, hand-holding and support because these are new instruments and new reporting guidelines that we can't know about until we've sort of gone through it. Um, so, um, in, uh, and, and I should also say that it complementary to the reporting standards that Kenya is also developing its green finance taxonomy, yeah. which also provides sort of technology definitions um, for different sectors um, across the economy, agriculture, manufacturing, infrastructure, and so on. So that also provides additional guidance. Um, but um, FSD Africa can handhold, uh, let's say, to identify what would qualify as an eligible green or social, or we're talking about a gender yeah. bond, what are the projects that can be financed through these kind of instruments. And um, also, uh, you know, how do you communicate that to investors, uh, depending on who the investors are? We have yeah. our domestic institutional investors, we have uh, foreign investors, um, and also there is uh, actually inbuilt a reporting requirement into these instruments, which makes them um, more transparent and clear, and that also adds to the attractiveness uh, to the investor. They like that. Yeah. Um, and so also on that uh, reporting front, there's an annual reporting requirement, let's say, with the sustainability bonds, we can assist with that. So we can basically assist with the entire um, you know, process and cycle um, of, of um, some of these instruments and the reporting requirements that are there. And there's a viewer here who's saying, uh, Cecilia is talking so much about this issue of gender bonds. What exactly <laughs> are gender bonds? <laughs> well... Um, it's financing that are uh, specifically sort of directed to um, women-owned or women-led businesses or business um, activities that benefit women. Yeah. Um, so it's really to bring forward uh, that opportunity. Uh, half the population is women and sometimes they are, you know, still underbanked. And so uh, we are missing out sometimes on, you know, half of the population and the brilliance uh, of the women uh, in this country. And so that's what that financing is trying to do, is trying to just, uh, you know, make financing available for, for those kind of businesses. All right. And we have also done some guidelines around uh, bond, uh, gender bond issuance. Uh, so that's available as well if you want to learn more for the, for the viewer who <laughs> asked Wonderful. the question. Yeah. So <laughs> hop onto the FSDA website and check on uh, yes. the guidelines around gender bonds. <laughs> Before we take a break, very quickly, um, Many times, and initially when you're talking about the question of uh, sustainable financing, it was always coupled with a conversation on fiscal incentives. In the present environment, it looks like we cannot afford, as a sovereign, fiscal incentives. Krishna, do you think that window for fiscal incentives is closed, and how do we go forward? Um, it is a challenging environment. There's no denial about the fact that many economies in the world are facing a very, very difficult, challenging macroeconomic situation. Uh, having said that, um, it boils down to the same question, right? What, without fiscal incentives, how do we build scale? How do we incentivize the end user to adopt a sustainable product? Because for a business to adopt sustainable practices, there is a short-term cost. Again, there is no denial about that. And the short-term cost will be passed on to the end customer. Now, if the end customer is already having trouble around affordability, and you're trying to sell a higher uh, costing solution, you need to find a way to uh, bring back affordability to the end user. Because unless he starts to adopt that product, you will not build scale. If you don't build scale, your ESG impact is not going anywhere. Yeah. Right. So, the while it's a difficult problem that fiscal incentives are challenging to provide in this environment, again it boils down to one of your previous questions. There is a cost to do something, but what's the cost of not, not doing, doing something? something. <laughs> if a fiscal in providing a fiscal incentive today costs you say two billion dollars, and you don't do it, and you have floods two years later because of climate change, one floods will cost you how much? Twenty billion dollars of losses? Yeah, I see. That's the magnitude to look at it. So the cost of inaction. Yes. James, fiscal incentives. Yes, um, and as Krishna has already mentioned, I think in the current environment uh, that may be a bit far off. Uh, but but what, what I've seen coming through is because of the general adoption by this population at large of sustainable practices, it's becoming a license to do business. You're finding a situation where, one, the clients are doing it because it's the right thing to do. So they are very, very conscious of the impact of not doing it. But secondly, is that the end users are now demanding 
that I will only buy from you goods which have been produced sustainably. We've seen it in even vegetables. Yeah. And people want certification that this is organic. Yeah. Or we've seen it in products where the fact that you say it's recycled plastic then gives you a competitive advantage on the person who's not doing it. So yes, the incentives are not coming by way of fiscal incentives, but are coming by way of market incentives in that you run the risk of being uh, crowded out of the market if you do not adopt sustainable practices. So yes, it's coming at a slightly higher cost and that's why the point you raised about scale is really, really important because as scale grows, the cost then also starts, uh, you know, it starts coming down and allows other people to also come in and start adopting sustainable practices. But yes, uh, the fiscal part's a bit way off now, but what you're seeing is the whole social agenda around acceptability of sustainability is forcing people to then adopt the practices or lose out completely from the market. So the social contract is coming into play. Absolutely. Cecilia, your thoughts on this question of uh, fiscal incentives? Well, there's also the other side of it uh, with harmful subsidies, which is also a fiscal incentive, but towards fossil fuels yeah. and, um, and um, you know, various uh, things uh, that are not necessarily over the long term contributing to a sustainable future. Um, so that's also something to look at. Um, uh, but I would say that um, also uh, the sustainable finance instruments, uh, they also apply to the public and the sovereign. So... Um, things like uh, sustainability linked bonds and yeah. sustainability bonds for the sovereign, uh, equally, just like for the private sector, it can broaden the investor base, um, attract guarantees that can extend maturities uh, and, and uh, sort of reduce payment burden and create some fiscal space. Yeah. And then it's important what we do with that, with that fiscal space also from a sustainability perspective. So there are always uh, opportunities uh, to, to work with this. But I would also say that uh, sustainability projects over the medium to long term, uh, they are financially viable on their own if we take a long term view. Um, we need to look at what we're doing from business perspective and investment <laughs> and see does it make sense over the long term the long and term. then we may not need uh, fiscal incentives. Yeah. All right, so clearly we need to have a clear foresight of the runway ahead of us. We want to take a very quick break. When we come back we shall have the last leg of this conversation and talk about the pertinent subject of greenwashing and what it means. Stay tuned. Our planet is calling and we must answer. This October 3rd and 4th, join us for the Earthwise Summit 2024, where change makers from around the world unite to create a sustainable future under the theme, equity, innovation, and resilience in the face of climate change. From innovative green technologies to bold climate solutions, Earthwise Summit 2024 brings together the brightest minds boldest ideas and you because the future of our planet is in our hands the summit will be held at kws clubhouse Nairobi, and be live on ntv at 8 a.m are you wearing a tie a safari slide Every journey starts with a bold step. Explore unforgettable adventures with a trusted partner. From sharing in-flight meals to touring Asia. Fly direct from Nairobi to Kuala Lumpur four times weekly starting November 15th, 2024. For over 15 years, Air Asia has been the world's best low-cost airline. Karibu Asia. Now everyone can fly. Is Dove better than ordinary soup? We're going to prove it. Take a barrel of your soup and dove. Use yours on one side, dove on the other. The soup part feels rough. The dove side is softer, smoother, and more radiant. With one quarter moisturizing cream, dove deeply nourishes for radiant skin all over. Try dove and feel the difference.
Welcome to the last leg of this conversation on Business Redefined. We are talking about sustainable finance and we want to drill down now to the final beat of our conversation. And because of the interest of time, let me start very quickly right with Cecilia here. Uh, so much interest around greenwashing. First of all, what exactly is greenwashing? Uh, greenwashing is when you are not doing what you said you would do uh, and thereby uh, you're, not, you're not living up to your commitment to investors, yeah. for example. Uh, so that's what that is. Uh, and, not good, basically. And so, and so um, <laughs> how much of a challenge is it, especially within the environment of sustainable financing? Well, I mean, there have been examples of greenwashing, certainly, by companies internationally. Um, um, but I would also say that um, there are mechanisms built into these instruments, and we're also moving towards more reporting. But in the instruments, there, there's already clarity in terms of what projects will be financed, what are the improvement targets that we are seeking to meet, and there's annual reporting towards that to investors and to the public. Um, so there is that mechanism to guard against greenwashing. Yeah. Uh, but I would also say that it's important for investors, our fund managers, to actually ask the right questions of the investees or yes. their investments um, to see how projects are going. And sometimes it's just about learning more about what, what, what is it we are trying to do from a sustainability perspective. So I think everyone can take their responsibility yeah. in trying to avoid uh, greenwashing. Um, yeah. Okay. James, isn't uh, disbursement based on milestones, I'd imagine, and doesn't, doesn't that give you then safeguards against greenwashing? Um, yes, and I must admit that we, we see mainly two forms of sustainable finance. There are those where from the onset it's use of, uh, use of proceeds, and that is normally easier because if Krishna or somebody else comes and says, I'm going to build a solar farm, then you see it's being used to build a, a solar farm. I guess it's the Sustainability, sustainability linked financing is the one that normally has a bit of challenges because we are doing our normal business but we are telling you we'll do it in a sustainable manner and that's where the milestones are very very critical and that's where the taxonomy comes into place and the standards about how do you then validate and yeah. increasingly what we're seeing arising out of this is third parties who then are necessary entity to come in and validate that yes if these are the commitments that were made we can validate for you and certify that yes, these have been achieved. So that's where the greenwashing challenge comes through. In some instances, it's not intentional. It's missing milestones. But in some other instances, the third, the part, the third parties can come in and assist you in validating that these are indeed uh, sustainable and have met the milestones. So that on this latter one is where a lot of the milestone checking is, is, is a critical component. I see. Uh, Krishna, as a beneficiary of sustainable finance, would you say the aspect of greenwashing then distorts the competitive landscape? Absolutely, because greenwashing has two elements to it, right? It, it includes misreporting and it also includes selective reporting, right? <laughs> so misreporting, there can also be genuine reasons for misreporting. For example, there is an evolving uh, knowledge on what exactly is a carbon emission. How do you set a baseline? Yeah. How do you how do you set, how do you uh, compute the uh, carbons carbon emissions avoided? Now, what we know about setting a baseline and computing carbon emissions is not the same methodology we had five years ago. Yeah. Now, what we followed five years ago today seems like greenwashing because it's also an evolving <laughs> evolving understanding of that, right? So we need to be conscious the, because we don't have all answers. There are no perfect answers. Our, our understanding is evolving globally, even for experts, even the best climate expert will not give you, will not be able to give you a perfect answer today, which will hold good for the next 100 years. Yeah. Yeah? So greenwashing is a challenge. I'm not denying the fact that there is mischief as well. So that's why I also included the word selective reporting. Selective reporting. You have many companies who talk about uh, paper, usage of recycled paper when they're polluting tons of uh, emissions into, into water bodies, right? Yeah. They, they go gung-ho about uh, using recycled paper in their office. Now, that's selective reporting for you. That's also greenwashing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? So now, when you have funds going into uh, uh, projects which are greenwashed, either misreporting or selective reporting, end of the day, you have a finite amount of funds. So the genuine projects which are actually creating impact will lose upon them. I see. Yeah? So it distorts the market. It uh, creates an artificial uh, run. And that's where, in the long run, everything there will be negative impact. Now, how do we, how do we solve for it? I think uh, on the selective reporting part, again, IFRS S1 and S2 are good standards because they define what 
needs to be reported how do you how do you identify material risk how do you identify what will make a difference to the investors who are investing in you what should they know about it yeah. so that's a that's a good starting point to avoid selective reporting on misreporting part of it as i said technology is evolving um, every sector every company every investor needs to be on top of it to to know that they are setting the baseline correct and computing the impact correctly all right. I, I have a lot more questions, but unfortunately, because of time, we have to dial this down. So six minutes to go, two minutes each for your closing thoughts. Let me start with Cecilia here. Oh, like uh, what we can do more of or wait. Yes, yeah, clear, take home, yes. Okay. Whether it's policy or whatever it is. Uh, right. Yes. Well, I mean, I think um, if we are looking at the private, uh, private sector, I mean, they are key to many of these solutions. So... Um, the private sector uh, should continue uh, to take an interest and see what are the sustainability solutions that we need to uh, find and fund and, and create and go out and look for the sort of the blended capital that can help you uh, implement those um, solutions. And also for investors, fund managers um, across the continent and in Kenya to take an interest in those investment instruments and see can, can this be something that where we can place our, our funds and how can we come together and partner uh, in these blended pools of capital to make it work. All right. <laughs> but with the sovereign at 18%, I wonder whether they can take that. <laughs> Krishna, well, your closing I, thoughts. I have a comment on that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, closing comments, sustainable finance is the way forward. Right? There is no um, exception or there is no way out of it. We need to invest in that. It's, there is a short-term cost for businesses to implement sustainability in their business practices. For investors, they need to be ready for a slightly lower rate of return, risk adjusted return, I would like to call that. Um, and for governments, there is a need for fiscal incentives. It is difficult, but we need to figure a way out to do it because not doing something is going to prove very, very costly for all of us. In the long run. In the long run. Uh, clearly. James again. Yeah. Yes, um, I think for us at APSA, um, sustainability is, an, is part and parcel of our, our business strategy. I mean, in line with our purpose of empowering Africa's tomorrow together, one story at a time, we have built values that talk about trust, resourcefulness, stewardship, inclusion, and, and, and courage, and all those just talk to doing business in a sustainable manner. So we are invested in your story. We are invested in being partners in working the sustainability journey together. and. We are doing it from the lead. We are practicing sustainability practices within APSA Bank as itself, and therefore willing to do this together with our stakeholders and our partners in ensuring that this becomes a global agenda in, from a Pan-African context, but also in influencing the agenda across the board. So very committed as APSA to sustainability. All right. Before we close, Cecilia, I'm very curious on your thoughts on the sovereign acts. Oh. <laughs> at, at 18%. Yeah. Well, actually, so fund managers, just to that point, fund managers uh, you know, are asking uh, for some minimum regulation to avoid this uh, high concentration risk in yes. government securities, which indeed is very hard to move out of that when you are assessed also on a, perhaps a quarterly basis. So how Correct. can you move ahead of someone else to a lower return? environment but so so the suggestion from some fund managers is actually to create a minimum floor uh, to enable that diversification so a bit controversial but uh, you know that's <laughs> and the minimum floor can be very small also it's just to encourage everyone to move together because it's something that is for the benefit over the long term um, so yeah all right some quick takes on uh, the policy outlook How, what policy initiative do you think would help to push this conversation forward you've already touched on fiscal incentives anything James I, I think for me is adoption of sustainable practices across the industry so it's a, a, a fair playing ground. We are seeing what NEMA is doing, what the central bank is doing, whether it's around you know, um, disposal of waste, etc. so that everybody moves together and yeah. nobody who holds back then has an unfair advantage you know, over everybody else. So we as a bank are committed to partnering with the policy uh, makers to ensure that this kind of policy frameworks are put in place to make the playing ground even for everybody to grow in a, uh, their sustainability agenda together. All right. Krishna, anything to add or I close? No, I think I've, I've made my point. All right, thank you very much. We have been having a conversation on sustainable finance, looking across a raft of issues, whether it is the, the reporting standards, whether it is the bankability of projects and the available capital, whether it is how to aggregate small players to be able to tap into these opportunities we have talked about, and to the excitement of many of you, the question of gender bonds, remember to go to the FSDA website and see the guidelines around this. And finally, discussing greenwashing and the policy environment and how we can ensure that this does not distort the competitive landscape to ensure that everyone then benefits from 
sustainable finance. Remember, the take home here is that we need to focus on the long game because the cost of doing nothing is a lot larger than the cost of doing something today. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, James again from APSA, Krishna from uh, Sun King, and Cecilia from FSD Africa. Thank you so much for being part of this. Let's do this again on Tuesday next week on the next episode of Business Redefined. Stay tuned.